Good evening and welcome to another uh, Thousand Shimmering Lights YouTube Live uh, Planetarium Show. I'm currently looking at the analytics and no one is here. So I'm talking to the future people who are going to watch this later, I guess, until some people show up. Uh, but what I will do is I will just go ahead and re repost all the things on the Facebook and uh, see if we can drum up some some more people. Oh, hey, Emily, <laughs> welcome. Okay, we have Emily here. If you are here, definitely say hi in the chat because I don't I think the analytics is currently saying no one's here, but there's definitely at least one person here. So that's cool. Uh, is Matt with you? Is Matt also watching? And the girls? And uh, I guess the girls and boys. I know you've got, you got both. All right. Well, welcome, and uh, we will we will get started uh, here in a little bit. I'm gonna try and drum up some more people, like I said, by by sharing this and trying to get a little bit more. Uh, oh, he's working. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and get a few more people here. I think there's an audio delay, by the way, so if it seems like I don't respond to your chat immediately, that's partially why, and that's also because I'm juggling a couple screens. But uh, let me get the video link here, and I'm going to... There we go. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this up on Facebook real fast and see if I can get some more people here. Alright, there we go. And I'm going to share this to a few groups. see here cool the kids are watching awesome uh, it says I've got three viewer viewers now uh, so whoever's out there uh, say hi in the comments let me know you're here again uh, I know it looks like I'm not doing much right now I'm just trying to uh, get the word out real fast see if I can drum up a few more people to, to show up before we get rolling with this thing and then uh, And then we'll start uh, with a couple of quick uh, opening announcements once there's actually some people here to hear them, and then we'll we'll launch into it. Um, while you do wait, though, uh, go ahead and start thinking of uh, if you have any questions or anything you're interested in talking about. Uh, one of the cool things about this stream is I don't plan in advance anything I'm going to talk about. I literally just let people's questions drive the discussion, and we will we'll hang out, we'll chat about whatever you think is cool whatever whatever is on your mind and you want to know about that's the idea uh, let's see here so did I post to the visual astronomy group eh, not gonna chance it all right there we go Hopefully we got some people showing up soon, but uh, for right now, for those of you guys who are here, I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, so this is A Thousand Shimmering Lights. This is the only uh, live YouTube internet planetarium uh, show uh, where you guys are the planetarium director, by which I mean that, like I was saying before, I don't plan any of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, I do kind of do a thing where I just sort of start going uh, a little bit and let people's questions come in but I for the most part I prefer to let the audience drive the discussion um, so definitely get in the chat be talkative don't be shy um, and suggest any kind of topics or, or anything that you're interested in questions what have you and that's gonna drive things um, I am the 
And some of this stuff is also just for people who watch this later on video, so they don't have all this dead time of me waiting for people to show up, because uh, all these episodes are recorded as well. So I am the uh, membership director for the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society, uh, or NEFIS for short. So if you live in the greater Jacksonville area and you are interested in astronomy, consider checking us out. We've got a Facebook page uh, called NEFIS, so you can look us up on Facebook. Um, we are starting to do uh, public outreach events again, where we set up telescopes and let people look through them now that some of the COVID restrictions are lightening up. Um, I do know that this, there's this new Delta strain, so we're, we are a little bit reevaluating things as well. Um, at present, we're still doing some of the public stuff um, with our members who are vaccinated, but that may change uh, soon because we do want to make sure we're keeping everybody safe. Obviously, if you do decide to come to any of our events, you're assuming your own personal risk in doing so. Um, but one thing I want to mention though is membership. Cause like I mentioned, I am the membership director. So if you do live in the greater Jacksonville area and you are interested in astronomy and you know, you've got a telescope or what have you, and you like to hang out with other like-minded people and talk about space. Hey Matt, welcome. <laughs> uh, then consider maybe being a, a member of the, of the club. Nix, welcome Nix. Um, so this is the NEFAS website. It's nefas.org, N-E-F-A-S.org. And if you are interested in becoming a member of our club, you can always go up to membership, join NEFAS. And then new or renew, if you're an existing member to renew. Got some people whose dues are coming up. And there you go. And you can join the club. Uh, membership rates, these are yearly rates. Uh, students and seniors is 20 bucks. Individuals, 40. Family, 50. Benefactor, and corporate are just two higher levels. You don't get anything special or extra. It's just ways to sponsor the club if you just feel like giving us more money. Um, so that is that. That's my quick little announcement for membership. And yeah, I, we'll just we'll just get into it, I guess. So again, I'm Dave, and this is A Thousand Shimmering Lights. Uh, oh, one other thing I want to mention. Um, there is a club in St. Augustine as well. Welcome, Jane. Glad to see you here. Uh, there's a St. Augustine club called the Ancient City Astronomy Club. So if you live in the greater St. Augustine area, um, consider becoming a member of that club. I'm actually a member of both. I think they're both awesome. And if you don't live in the Jacksonville area or St. Augustine or anywhere near Florida, because I posted this to a couple of groups that aren't local, um, and I do hope we get a lot of people from just all over, then seriously consider checking out whoever your local astronomy club is um, if you are interested in, in astronomy. Oh, yeah. yeah, Matt, I know. It never quite worked out. One of the advantages of doing this virtual thing is I can use a fake sky and I can time travel and I can make it work. And on that note, I'll go ahead and get started and start talking about some of the stuff in the sky tonight. Um, again, the purpose of this show is it's driven by viewership. So the whole idea is I don't script ahead of time what I'm going to talk about. There is no such thing as a dumb question. If there's any question or topic that occurs to you, just throw that right in the chat. Feel free to be talkative. I love the interaction. This is supposed to be very interactive. And I like knowing that you're here, so I'm not just talking at my wall. Um, and we'll just go wherever the night takes us. We're just going to hang out for a couple hours. So to kick it off, though, while you guys think of whatever you're interested in, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the night sky tonight. So this is Stellarium Web, by the way. This is free software that I use. Um, there is a web-based version and a downloadable version. They're both free. There's also an app for your phone that has a free version and like a $2 version. It's highly, highly worth it. Um, it's just really cool software. But I've got mine set to Jacksonville. Um, if you're not familiar with, with Planetarium software, um, obviously it shows you the night sky. It shows you where things are. Um, the way that the stars are represented as dots is that there's the size of the dot correlates to the brightness of that star. So as you're looking in the software and you see that some of these dots are bigger than other star bigger than other dots, that's a way of representing uh, <laughs> Okay, we got a great question already. Uh, so we'll hop on that in here in a second. Uh, but yeah, so that that's a way of representing brightness. So in the chat already somebody says, "Hey spaceman, are the sun and the moon above the firmament like lights above a snow globe or within it? If they are within it, how come the moon sometimes goes invisible? Um, so that is uh, obviously 
I think they're just trying to be funny, but um, there is no firmament. Uh, the Earth is a sphere, and the Earth orbits the sun, which is actually a star. Um, and I will bring up a visual aid to show how that works. Uh, for my visual aids, I used to just Google images, but I got a copyright strike, even though this is not monetized. It's all nonprofit and it's all educational. But, you know, what are you going to do? So now I've figured out that I can just use the Wikimedia Commons to help me out. So let's see here. What's the best image for getting across my point? Uh, we'll go with this somewhat inaccurate image, but it's an approximation. The problem is you can never get a really good solar system where the size of the orbits themselves and the objects orbiting are on the same scale because the planets become invisible. That's how vast the distances are. So any image of the solar system, any artist's impression of the solar system is always going to be distorted in some way. So uh, to answer the question about why we don't see the sun and the moon in the sky all the time and in, in the firmament or above the firmament is that there isn't a firmament actually. Um, what there is is that the earth is a sphere uh, the Earth orbits around an enormous uh, ball of fusing hydrogen that we call the Sun. And the Moon is an orbit around the Earth. And so sometimes you don't see the Moon because it's on the other side of the Earth at that particular time. And at night you don't see the Sun because we've rotated around and you're pointing away from the Sun, of course. Um, and the Sun is a star. So when you see the stars in the night sky, those are other suns that may well have their own planets and, and things as well. Uh, an interesting, a couple interesting points that this does bring up, though, is for one thing, uh, if you notice, uh, as the moon orbits the, the Earth, you would expect that sometimes it's on the daytime side of the Earth, right? And we often think of the moon as a nighttime object, but actually it spends just as much time being part of the daytime sky as it does being part of the nighttime sky. Um, obviously when the moon is getting sort of between us and the sun, uh, this, the sun's own brightness that the moon passes close to the sun in the sky, the sun's going to completely outshine it. So sometimes we don't see the moon for that reason. Um, but oftentimes if you, if you go looking for it, you can find the moon during the day. Um, of course, the other thing that happens is that when the moon is on that side of the earth, it's the back side of the moon that's illuminated and most of the face is in darkness. So that also makes it a little bit more difficult to see during the daytime. So we tend to see daytime moons as like crescents, right? Anywhere from a crescent up to like half of a moon uh, would be visible during the day. But larger phases, brighter moons, closer to the full, we would expect to see at night. But a really good question that I would pose to you guys, I'll let you think about it for a second, and then um, we'll come around and talk about what the actual answer is, is if... The moon is orbiting around the sun, right? And if we get a solar eclipse every time the moon passes between us and the sun and blocks the sun's light, right? That's what causes a solar eclipse. And the moon completes one orbit every month. That's where we get the concept of a month. It's a 28-day orbital cycle, so roughly every month. Then why don't we get a, a solar eclipse every single month? Why doesn't the moon block the sun every single time it comes around in its orbit? I'll let you guys think about that, see if you could think of some reasons why that might be, and we'll circle back around to it while I take a look at these constellations. But don't worry, I am going to come back around and answer that question. All right, so we're just going to hide that real fast and take a look here. So this is what's in the sky tonight. We're going to start off talking a little bit about the sky tonight. I've got mine set to Jacksonville, but this is pretty much anywhere in the northern hemisphere. Um, so this is me looking south, and some of the most prominent constellations that you'll see in the sky right now are Scorpius and Sagittarius. I'll add the lines so that you guys can see them a little bit more clearly. Um, Sagittarius, you'll notice these really bright stars in this main body shape here. And I've always felt like this looks like a teapot. A lot of us call it the teapot. It's the Sagittarius teapot, a very recognizable shape in the night sky. Um, so when you look south, uh, these stars, you see how big these dots are, they're fairly bright. So you shouldn't have too much trouble finding this teapot shape in the sky. Scorpius, the easiest way to find Scorpius, if I'm going to actually delete the lines, to make this a little bit clearer. Um, the easiest, easiest way to find Scorpius, I think, is to look for these three stars right here. Tau Scorpii, Antares, 
and oops, not M4, and Alniot. They form a sort of curve, right? They're not completely straight. It's a bit of a curve. And then these three stars right here forming another curve. And so you'll see sort of the one curve and the other like this in the sky. And that, I find, is the biggest giveaway for Scorpius. You see those are all fairly big dots. Once you find that, it's easy to find the rest of the constellation because you take this curve right here going through Antares, and you can extend this down to Epsilon, Scorpii, Mu, all the way down through these, and it sort of curves around like this up to Shaula, and then it comes over to G Scorpii there. And that's the long sort of whippy tail and stinger of the scorpion. Of Scorpius the Scorpion. And those are uh, two constellations that are definitely associated with um, with summertime. And somebody has already correctly answered the the question in the chat that the it's the, the plane of the orbit. And that's exactly right. So that question, I love asking that to people because it challenges a simplistic view of the universe. When we see a chart like this, it's important to remember this is a simplification right that the moon it's not everything is on this nice even plane where the earth is going around the sun the moon's going around the earth and we view it two-dimensionally we imagine we're looking at it like a map on a sheet of paper but actually the universe is three-dimensional and so objects orbits are all kind of canted different ways and so if we imagine that this flat hand represents the plane of earth's orbit kind of going around like this the moon's orbit is tilted like that and so sometimes when the moon if i um I can use something as a visual representation. This uh, empty can of Pepsi that I really shouldn't have in here because I should clean my room is going to represent the Earth. My face is going to be the sun, right? So when the moon is orbiting, it's not doing this flat thing right here. It's coming up and down like this. And so we get a solar eclipse when that orbit brings it at the same level here where it's blocking the light from the sun. But if we sort of rotate things around, sometimes the moon is coming up in its orbit right when it gets here and so it's above me from the perspective of the earth it isn't going to block the sun's light right so that's why we don't get an eclipse and so if you look at the moon's tilted orbit there are there's a place on the front of the orbit and the back of the orbit where the moon crosses the equator on its way down basically right so one orbit the moon's orbital plane and the earth's orbital plane they're going to intersect right and that happens twice on one side of the earth and on the other we call those intersections nodes All right there's an ascending node when the moon is on its way up and a descending node on its way down and so eclipses happen when the moon is between the earth and the sun and it's at the node right so if it's between the earth and the sun and it's at one of those two nodes we can get a solar eclipse if the earth is between the sun and the moon and the moon is near the node we can get a lunar eclipse. Because the Earth is so much bigger than the Moon, there's a bit more uh, wiggle room there for causing a, a lunar eclipse where we block the sun's light from hitting the Moon. And somebody said, uh, yeah, it's, the real tilt is only five degrees. It's not big, but because the, the Moon is so far, so far from the Earth, it still is enough of an effect that the shadow just shoots right past the Earth sometimes. Uh, now, uh, Matt asked about Lagrange points. This is a really cool topic. So basically, um, Lagrange points are like particularly stable positions in orbit relative to a body. So I'll see if I can bring up a nice visual for Lagrange points here. Matt with the deep cuts. Uh, okay, so here is a diagram of Lagrange points. These are the Lagrange points for the Earth, right? So, what on Earth is happening in this in this uh, in this diagram? So basically, you always feel the gravitational pull of the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, all the time, right? So right now, sitting in my chair. The earth is pulling on me. It's pulling me towards the ground. But the sun is actually also affecting me gravitationally. And the sun's own gravity is actually pulling me the other way towards the sun. And the moon a little bit too. But the, the, the gravity obeys something called the inverse square law. Which means that the further away you get, 
half again and half again and half again is how strong the gravity is, right? It's an inverse of the square of the distance. That's why we call it the inverse square law. But to simplify it, the further you get from something, the less gravity you feel. And it's not a nice linear thing where it's just like, you know, 10, 9, 8, whatever. It's dropping off by a square root. So it drops off quickly, right? The further you get from something. So although I am feeling the gravity of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun right now, I am feeling the Earth way more than I feel the sun or the moon's gravity to the extent where the gravity of the sun and the moon affecting my own body is negligible compared to that of the earth, which is why I don't float out of my chair, right? Because the earth is able to hold on to me. Now, if this is the case, if you imagine like a gradient coming off of the earth where the gravity gets steadily less and less and less, and a gradient from the sun where the gravity gets steadily less and less and less, you can imagine that there's a point at which they're just about even right where the sun and the moon are pulling an object basically equally and so the object doesn't go either way right so that is what we get with a lagrange point right so if i'm looking at this diagram l1 is about that point now l1 is actually going to be a lot closer to the earth than the sun and the reason is because the sun is a lot bigger than the earth so the equilibrium, the sun and the earth are not equal in terms of their gravity. You have to be further away from the sun and closer to the earth for them to even out. Um, on the back side of the earth, you get another Lagrange point because the earth's gravity and gra sun's gravity are both fading away as you get further. And you wind up getting to a point where they more or less kind of cancel each other out. And that's Lagrange 2. And then the, these other Lagrange points, I'll be honest, I don't really understand them super well. But you get one sort of ahead and behind in the orbit and on the opposite side of the sun, right? And basically what these are useful for is normally if you're going to put a satellite or something in orbit, it always has to be orbiting something, right? You can have a satellite orbit the Earth, a satellite can orbit the sun or whatever. But you can also just park something in a Lagrange point And rather than orbiting in the normal sense, it just gets carried by that place of like equalized gravity. And it just kind of sits there. So we actually have, um, I think Lagrange 1 is where the SOHO is, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, um, which is a, a satellite that just watches the sun all the time, and it just parks there at L1. It doesn't actually orbit the sun, I think. I, I want to say that's the where the SOHO is. We, I think we have a couple things out there, but that's a Lagrange point. They're really cool. They're kind of hard to explain, as you probably noticed. Um and they are a, sort of an exception to the general idea that you can... Um, oh, okay, there we go. Matt mentioned it's the centripetal force balancing gravity. Yeah, so that, I think, is what accounts for the L4 and L5. Um, but that's a, another very cool topic. Uh, Sputnik Hubble says, I'm here. Hey, Sputnik Hubble, welcome. Uh, all right, I think I'll minimize this real fast and get back to talking a little bit about what's in the sky tonight. One thing I definitely want to mention um, that's in the sky is that we have Jupiter and Saturn. And Jupiter is actually, uh, I think it hits opposition tonight or it hit opposition last night. Um, basically opposition, if I were to bring back up that solar system diagram, if you imagine there's like the sun, right? And then this bottle of paint is the Earth, right? And we're all kind of orbiting around and we're sort of all over the place in the solar system. Opposition is when we end up exactly opposite, right? So that means that we've got the sun on the daytime side, and then at midnight straight up, you would see a planet because it's on the exact opposite, right? It's where we catch up to it or it catches up to us in the orbit, so that's the best time to view that planet. Um, obviously, it's something that happens with outer planets. So Jupiter is either, again, it's either hitting opposition tonight or it hit it last night. Um, so great time to view Jupiter because that's the closest we can get to it, right? Uh, Saturn, I think, is going to hit opposition in September, I want to say. Um, but that's really cool, so you can definitely observe those tonight. That's worth checking out. Um, one really cool thing that's going to happen tonight, and I'm going to use the time travel capacity of this software to show you. If I jump ahead a few hours... Uh, hmm, I'm not really seeing it. Somebody was saying that the moon was supposed to have an occultation with Nunki, this star right here. But I'm not seeing it happen in the software. 
Maybe it was a different star? Let me double check. Because somebody posted this on Facebook, and I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, Matt's got to go. Okay, well, it's, it's cool seeing you again, definitely. We're going to be here for two hours. Feel free to hop back on or watch it later or what have you. Uh, let me see if I can find out more about that opposition. Or maybe it was last night and I missed it. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I think it was actually last night that it happened, and I, maybe I just didn't see the post until today. But one of our club members, Richard, who, uh, if you're on the NIFA's Facebook page and you check out any of Richard's stuff, he takes some really cool... Yeah, somebody else said it was last night. Okay. Um, Richard takes some really cool images of Jupiter, and he posted about a transit tonight. Uh, real quick to explain what an occultation is, if you don't know. So I'm not actually going to change... I'm going to time travel to last night. There it is. So you can see... So an occultation is when the moon, and we're going to time travel minutes at a time here, uh, maybe a little bit more. Where did it go? Ah. Should I go ahead in time? Anyway, an occultation is when the moon uh, actually blocks something behind it, right? So a planet or a star. So last night it blocked a star for a little bit, which is kind of cool to watch. Um, one thing that's going to happen tonight with Jupiter is, ooh, and there's a really good question about the moon. So I'm going to hop on that here in a second uh, after I make this quick announcement. So Jupiter is going to have a cool event tonight after my show. At what time? Somebody was talking about it. Here we go. A transit of Io across Jupiter. So Jupiter has four moons that are easily observed from Earth through a telescope. Uh, we call them the Galilean moons because Galileo discovered them. They are Io, which I've always thought it should be pronounced Eo, but apparently even Wikipedia says it's Io, so I guess I lose that argument. But Io, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And one of them, Io, is going to pass in front of the Jupiter's disk tonight. So that would be a cool thing to check out. We call that a transit. And you can see the little dot go across. Um, so somebody asked, is the moon always the same distance from the Earth? And that is a really cool question, which has a really cool answer. And Nix is already kind of hopping on it. Nix, you got to let me answer some of these, man. This is my show. I'm just kidding, man. It's cool that you guys are, uh, are hopping on these. But yeah. So um, this is something we call apogee and perigee. So orbits are not actually circular, right? So we, we, we represent orbits sometimes when we draw our little cartoon picture of the solar system when we're in class, you know, back in middle school as these like concentric circles. But actually, uh, orbits are not circles. They're what are called ellipses, meaning that they're slightly oval shaped, essentially, right? And that was actually discovered way back uh, in the Middle Ages by Johannes Kepler. It's one of Kepler's laws of planetary motion that planets move in ellipses and we now know that it's not just planets but any object orbiting another object is going to do so um real fast youtube is telling me that um we're not getting a smooth stream you guys let me know if that's the case if you're not getting good audio or video quality let me know in the chat i'll maybe try and see if i can close some background stuff or get my roommate to stop using bandwidth or something but um otherwise i'm just going to keep going so yeah it's slightly elliptical right which means that there's a point in the orbit where the object gets the closest it's going to get to the thing it's orbiting, and then a point where it gets a little bit further away, right? Uh, so the moon has... Oh, okay, got you. So that's Sarah and, and Katie that are talking. Hey, how's it going, guys? I haven't seen you in forever. Um, so, excellent. You guys are getting good video quality. I love it. Tell your friends, man. Let's get more people on this. Have a real, real hangout. So... Uh, we call that apogee and perigee. And so the moon does get a little bit closer in its orbit, a little bit further in its orbit sometimes. Um, the term supermoon is one of those big hype things. I'm not a big hype person. I, I'm glad that people get excited about space, and that's cool. And, and if people get excited about the moon, I'm happy. Um, but I feel like sometimes we do a bit of a disservice um, when the the news will like latch on to stuff and hype it and i feel like the the moon gets hyped more than anything else right and so you get this term super moon and what a super moon is is it's when we have a full moon 
and the moon happens to be at perigee, so it happens to be the closest point in its orbit. Um, because the moon does move a little bit closer and a little bit further away, its apparent size in the sky will fluctuate slightly. So as the moon is slightly bigger, appears slightly bigger because it's a little bit closer than at other times. But the difference is like one sixteenth of the radius. So it's really, really imperceptibly tiny in terms of the difference. So you'll sometimes hear people say, oh, we're going to have a super moon tonight. Get out and look. And it just looks like a normal full moon, right? It's it's t a tiny bit bigger, but nothing you could really tell, right? But what's interesting is Mars actually has a fairly eccentric orbit, meaning it's more ovally, right? It's less circular than a lot of the other planets, right? So most of the planet's orbits are not perfect circles, but they're close. But Mars's orbit is a little bit wacky. So Mars really does get noticeably closer to us sometimes than other times. And so about every 15 to 20 years, we get uh, a, a, um, a period where we reach opposition with Mars, we catch up to it in the orbit, and... Mars happens to be at its closest point to the sun and therefore us because we're closer to the sun. And so we get a really nice view of Mars. We had one of those a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, with my 10 inch telescope, I was actually able to sketch surface details of Mars because I was able to, to blow it up and view it nice and big in the telescope where normally it's just kind of an orange dot. Right. So, it was it was really cool actually. It was some of the best views of Mars I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Twenty years from now, we'll have another opportunity. So uh, look out for that. Uh, I mentioned before with the moon, I called the I used the terms apogee and perigee. That G comes from geo, meaning Earth. So when Mars does it, we use the terms aphelion and perihelion. Helio meaning Sun, right? So. Uh, so while the super moon is not that impressive, it is a little surprising that we don't hear people go on more about a super Mars. Although actually, no, we do because every every year it feels like we have to debunk Facebook memes that are like, Mars is going to be bigger than the moon. And it's like, no, it's not. Not even a little bit. Right. First of all, that's from three years ago when we had an aphelion. And secondly, no. No, if, if Mars looked bigger than the moon in the sky, we'd be doomed, right? That would be bad, bad news. Uh, and that's what I talk, that's what I mean with, when it comes to hype. I think it's cool to get people excited about space, but, but sometimes false stuff gets spread, right? And people uh, get excited about things that aren't really going to happen. Uh, Mike, one of our club members, Mike, uh, who's also in that St. Augustine club I mentioned, uh, says he got Deimos at the last opposition in his 10-inch uh, not sure even a 16 would be enough next time. Yeah, that's that again. So Deimos is one of Mars's moons. Uh, Mars's moons are pathetic. They're like deep space potatoes. They're not impressive by any stretch. So to be able to see one of Mars's moons through an amateur 10 inch telescope from Earth, that says something about how impressive that that opposition was a few years ago. It was it was something else. Actually, I can show you if you guys want to see. I'll show you the sketch I made of um, of Mars. Let me uh, get it ready for you here real fast. Search Mars. Here we go. And, ooh, really tiny. There we go. So this is actually the image I, this is the sketch I made. Now, mind you, it wasn't this big in my telescope. It was small in the telescope, and there was a lot of empty space. I used the circle to represent the planet, not the view from the telescope in this particular case. But yeah, I was able to see, uh, and I later was able to identify these features. Certus uh, Certus Major, Certus Minor, Eridania, Mare Australe, Elysium. Uh, so again, it was really cool. Um, I remember the previous year we had like a nice close approach, not as close cause you get like the years before and after you get decent oppositions. 
And so the previous year, I remember we had a good opposition, but there was a dust storm that had covered the whole planet, and you couldn't see anything. So uh, when this when this one came around, and what when was this actually? This was October last year, actually. Yeah, it was just last year. Um, was this really? Man, I thought that was uh, longer ago. Okay. Anyway, um, the, it, it had cleared up beautifully. There was no dust or whatever. I did actually see a cloud at one point. There was a transient feature that came and went. It turned out it was just a cloud. Um, or I, I suspect it was. There's no way I could have confirmed it. But uh, luckily, the dust kind of cleared up, and we were able to get a really good uh, view of Mars. And that's the sketch. I've obviously scanned it in the computer and kind of blow out the contrast a little bit to make it easier to see, but... So, yeah, it was pretty cool, man. It was pretty cool when, when Mars hit opposition. Uh, people in the comments saying they like my sketches. I'm glad you guys like my sketches. And the cool thing about them is no one's going to give me a copyright strike for posting my own sketch. Uh, <laughs> I hope I don't sound bitter about that. I just was surprised. It was actually not even on YouTube. It was uh, Facebook because I repost these on Facebook. It just said, um, this was flagged. It may contain copyrighted material. Didn't say what it was. Didn't say what five minutes out of the two hours worth of video I needed to look at or who made the claim or what the problem. It just said, maybe does. Can you take it down? And I was like, fine. I didn't feel like fighting it. But uh, now that we actually have a, a decent amount of viewers, I also want to mention uh, a retraction I need to make from the last one of these I did. I was going to wait until I had enough people here before I announced it. So in my last video, we were talking about Jovian planets, gas giant planets, and how the word Jovian means like Jupiter, because Jove was another name for the Roman god Jupiter, and Jupiter is also a gas giant planet. And I had said that the, the word Jove as a name for Jupiter came from the Romans syncretizing the Hebrew god when they first met the Hebrews, and they just assumed that was the same god as Jove. So it turns out, that's not even close to correct. I don't know where I got that misconception. And the word Jove is not etymologically related to the Hebrew name of God at all. It's a coincidence that they sound similar and has a completely different root. And that I just wanted to retract that. That, I, that what I said about the history of the term Jove applying to Jupiter in my last video is factually incorrect. And that the word Jove just was another thing that the Romans called Jupiter unrelated to um, the four-letter name of God in Hebrew. So there you go. Uh, it's, I think it's very important that I give accurate information when I can, obviously, on this channel, and to remind everybody that I don't have like a PhD or anything. I'm just some guy that does this because I, I just believe in it. I believe in educating people about the universe. And it's important to, to fact-check me, and if I get something wrong, I always want to be honest about that and let you guys know because what's most important is that, obviously, we're we're accurate, right? So, what was I talking about? We were talking about the moon and perigee and apogee and the uh, the occultation that we missed last night. But luckily tonight, we can definitely check out Jupiter and Saturn. Um, here's something else to take a look at. And this is a cool topic that I'll start talking about while I wait for you guys to ask more questions in the comments. Is if you look, if I turn off the atmosphere here in the software... You can see that if we're, if we're looking over here at Sagittarius and Scorpius, like I mentioned before, we're also seeing the Milky Way, right? So the Milky Way is the galaxy that we live in. If you didn't know, and again, the whole purpose of these online videos is this is outreach and education. So I want people who don't know these things, right? So don't feel weird about your question at all. If you've got a question that you think is going to make you look dumb, ask it, right? This is the place to learn. And so... Uh, if you didn't already know, the Milky Way is actually a galaxy. It's a big swirling disk of stars, and we, our star, the sun that we orbit, and therefore us, are embedded in that disk. And so when we look through that disk that we live in, from our perspective on the Earth, it looks like a big streak across the sky. But if you were to be able to escape the galaxy and look down on it, it would look like a flat disk. Uh, and that's what you actually see. So if you get out somewhere nice and dark and you see this bright area, this bright streak across the sky, that's actually the Milky Way. Um, I took a friend out with me one time to a, a nice dark location and we were checking some stuff out. I was showing him some planets and things. 
And and he basically asked, he, he said, Dave, I feel like it's kind of a dumb question, but I said, there's no such thing as a dumb question. What's the question? And he said, what is the Milky Way made out of? Because I've seen it and I've heard people say Milky Way and I've always been like too afraid to ask, like, what are we actually seeing? I don't want to look dumb. No need to be afraid. Uh, the answer is, is stars. That bright streak you're seeing is actually, if you could zoom in on it, just thousands and thousands and thousands of stars, right? Hence the name of this channel, A Thousand Shimmering Lights. That's what that's what the Milky Way is. And so, like I mentioned before, stars are just other suns, right? They're other suns in the universe, uh, in in our galaxy, Um and that's what you're seeing when you when you're looking at the Milky Way. All this bright glowiness is just more stars than you can count. The individual stars that you see are much closer, so you're able to pick them out individually. And then the Milky Way, you're looking through so many stars they just kind of blur together in a big bright streak. Uh, if you really like looking at the Milky Way and you just want to get out and check it out, first of all, I always encourage you to get out somewhere dark and check it out. Um, but now is a great time. Now is a really great time to observe the Milky Way. As you notice here in the software, it looks really wide and bright over here near Sagittarius and Scorpius. If I move over and we start to move to the other side of the sky, this is a lot dimmer, right? And that's not that's not an accident, right? The summer is the best time to view the Milky Way. It's going to be the biggest and brightest and most beautiful you've ever seen it. And that's because we get a different view, a different perspective on the Milky Way throughout the year as we orbit around it. So I'm gonna try and pull up another image for you guys. And I'm not gonna, this is not gonna be the Milky Way, I'm just gonna use a Milky Way lookalike. Um, another galaxy that is similar enough to the Milky Way that it'll, it'll, it'll serve as a stand-in for the Milky Way. And I'll bring it up for you guys here. And again, don't be shy. Throw some throw some questions down in the comments. If you guys aren't asking questions, I'm having to make up stuff to talk about, and I much prefer to talk about the things that you're interested in. But by all means, if you're if you're enjoying this discussion of the Milky Way, hang out and enjoy it, and then uh, feel free to throw some questions in there. And then when I'm done talking about the Milky Way, I'll grab them. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. How to add your your own background to Stellarium? That's a good question. I would check out Stellarium help, but I I don't know how to do that. The web-based version has like a default sort of generic skyline, but yeah, that would be cool to make it look like your own background, right? I got to be honest, man. I love the Stellarium software. There's been times where I've just really wanted to get out and observe and couldn't, and I like virtually observe just by using Stellarium, just pulling stuff up and farting around man it's because it, i couldn't take out my actual telescope so this here and i'm going to blow it up nice and big this is messier 83 it's also called the southern pinwheel galaxy uh, because there's a bigger galaxy called m33 it's much closer which is also called the pinwheel galaxy and so messier 83 um which is further south in the sky it's further towards the southern end of the sky and so we call it the southern pinwheel galaxy um, it is a barred spiral galaxy Meaning that, um, first of all, galaxy means that it's an enormous collection of stars. Galaxies are um, billions of stars uh, with a B. Billions of stars all gathered together forms a galaxy. Um, many of the other objects we talk about in astronomy, planets, nebulae, star clusters, these things live in galaxies. Galaxies are one of the biggest things in the universe. Um, the only thing bigger structure wise is that you'll get these big chains of galaxies, but galaxies are, are the biggest things basically. Um, and they're just big swirling balls of stars. Uh, spiral galaxies have these cool spiral arm patterns. There are also elliptical galaxies, which are just big swarms, big balls of stars. And then a barred spiral. This is an interesting thing. A lot of galaxies will have what's called a bar where you see there's like a line of stars in the middle. So the spiral doesn't just spiral out immediately but it actually shoots out and then spirals that's actually really common there's a lot of galaxies that have that and ours is no exception the milky way actually has a bar as well um so it's like a barred spiral so we have this big bar in the middle and then the spiral arms come off here and here now in the middle of the galaxy there's a dense core 
of a ton of stars, just absolutely dense with stars. And then the density kind of drops off towards the outer edges, um, with the arms being more dense than the gaps in between them, where there are fewer stars. Now, our sun, if we imagine that this is not M83, but we're looking at the Milky Way, we don't live here in the middle, right? This bright orange one that you see here is too bright and orange to be the sun, but I'm going to use it as a stand-in for the sun to make it easy to see. That's kind of like where we live in the Milky Way, right? So we're just on the inside of a spiral arm. Um, they, they actually, we, we astronomers have been able to chart out a lot of these arms and give them names. So we live on the Orion spur of the Perseus arm, if you're curious. So the, the big spiral arm is named the Perseus arm. And then there's like a little bit that kind of breaks off a little bit. And we live there, um, which means that there's a big gap. And then there's this one, which in our galaxy, this is analogous to the Sagittarius arm, right? And of course, you're going to kind of get a feeling for why we call it that, because if I remove this and we're looking at Sagittarius here in the sky, we're looking towards that arm, right? This is the Sagittarius arm that we're seeing. Hence, we name it that because it's in the direction of Sagittarius, right? Astronomers are not always creative with what we name things. But anyways, that's kind of where we live. Now, if you imagine that you see my mouse pointer here and it's got that little lollipop shape because it's the magnifying glass, but just picture that white circle there is the earth, right? I'm going to try and keep it steady. So the earth orbits around the sun, right? So we're following that white ball around the sun like this. And it happens to be that our orbital plane is tilted. So this is the galaxy. Here's our orbit. It's not completely dead on. Again, remember these things are actually three dimensional, but it's not that far off from the galactic plane. So our orbit will take us, around the sun and so when we're over here right we don't look in the direction of the sun nighttime is whatever way is away from the sun so it, when, when we're on this side of the sun our nighttime sky we look across the gap at this and the core and everything else all of this together from our perspective we're looking through the thickness of the whole galaxy the core, everything, when we look in that direction, right? When we orbit around the Earth, the sun and we come to this side, instead of looking at that, because the sun is now in the way, we're looking outward through the Perseus arm and then on into deep space, right? And so for this reason, we get different views of the Milky Way at different times of the year. And it just ha happens to be that the northern hemisphere of the Earth is experiencing winter when we're on this side looking out through the Perseus arm and we're experiencing summer when we're looking this direction in through the Sagittarius arm. And so spring would be sort of over here-ish and so we're still getting a good view or fall I mean to say fall would be like over here-ish and we're still getting a decent view of that and then as we move into winter um, we're going to be moving into a position where we won't get as good a view of the Milky Way galaxy. And so that's why if you want to get out somewhere and just appreciate the awe and beauty of the Milky Way, the summertime is a really good time to do that. And if you look again here in the software, you can even see where it gets wide at a certain point. And that's the actual bulge. That's that core in the middle of the galaxy. So it's really cool. Once you, if you observe the Milky Way throughout the year, you get a real sense that you're actually moving through this galaxy and you get this idea of your position in the universe. It's been a second since I've checked on our chat, so let me take a quick look here. Uh, let's see here. Actually, a couple of really cool questions. Um, Emily asks, are there stars between galaxies? I'm going to put a pin in that because talking about the intergalactic space is actually really cool. So we're going to hop on that one here in a second. And then Jane asks, I wonder what it'd be like if we, the Earth, were in the central core part of the Milky Way would we be closer to other stars all swirling into a black hole? Yeah, so as Jane points out, there is a supermassive black hole in the very middle. Um, we actually call that supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star because if we look at Sagittarius, it lives about here, right? So it's considered to be in the area of the sky that we identify with the constellation Sagittarius. So we call it Sagittarius A star. In fact, I can actually look it up real fast. Sagittarius... Oh, goodness, do I even know how to spell Sagittarius? Let me get the constellation name. 1G, 2Ts. Okay, Sagittarius A 
I don't know if Stellarium has it in the database. Maybe not in the web-based version. I was hoping it would point out where the Sagittarius A-star um, supermassive black hole is. But yeah, there is a supermassive black hole there. If we did live near the center of our galaxy, uh, first of all, our night sky would be really crowded. You're right. There would just be a riot of stars in every direction. Um, I think the with that many stars, there might be some danger of radiation. So our own magnetic field protects us from the sun's radiation. But if we imagine that there were a ton of stars all throwing radiation everywhere, it might actually be enough to overcome the um, the magnetic field. I'm actually curious. That's a curious question I'd like to answer. Um, but I do know it would be a, a much different place than it is way out here. And yeah, and the sky would just be absolutely alive with stars. It would... Uh, I almost wonder if we would even have darkness at night if you were really in the core, right? The core is very, very bright. Uh, that's a really good question, what the core would be like. I'm going to move on to Emily's question, though, because I did say I want to put a, wanted to put a pin in that and come back to it because the intergalactic world is interesting. So the answer to the question, are there stars between galaxies, the short version is yes, um, but the more interesting version is that galaxies lack a hard edge. So a galaxy is not a solid object like my phone, right? It is a sort of tenuous object, which is just a collection of stuff, right? So a galaxy is a collection of stars. And so there's no hard edge to it. Instead, what it is is that the stars, the density of stars drops off as you move further and further out of the galaxy into where... You get to like the outer parts of the galaxy where you just have scattered individual stars. If you imagine like a cloud of fog, there's no clear edge to the fog. You just get fewer and fewer and fewer water molecules the further you get from that cloud of fog. Um, however, it is also true that all the stars in a galaxy are all affecting each other all the time with their gravity and they're always altering and adjusting each other's orbits. And it is possible for a star to get slung out and to no longer be held in the gravitational influence of all the other stars in that galaxy and to wind up being out in intergalactic space. That happens. Um, there are also cases where galaxies interact with each other. So galaxies that get close to each other can tug on each other gravitationally and distort because they're not solid and twist and move and this kind of thing. And sometimes galaxies will even pass through each other. And in that passing through, the gravity will alter the orbits and cause stars to shift and twist and move and stuff. And sometimes stars get ejected as a result of that. So yes, there, there very well are, uh, I would expect there would be extra galactic stars out there. Um, the vast majority by far of stars are in galaxies, right? But um, there are certainly sporadic stars that are out there between galaxies. Um, in a similar way, if you were to zoom down a level of organization and consider within a galaxy that we always think of planets as orbiting stars and being parts of solar systems, but a similar thing can happen to planets. And there's nothing to prevent a planet or a comet or an asteroid from getting ejected from its solar system completely because of gravitational interactions with another star or within the solar system or what have you. And so there are actually rogue, they call them rogue planets out there that formed around a star at some point and got thrown away and are now careening through deep space, uh, not associated with any particular star. And in fact, um, it was an object called Oumuamua. It wasn't a planet. It was like a comet basically but it wasn't from our solar system. It got ejected from a star somewhere in the galaxy and it had been just screaming through deep space and eventually came, whipped around the sun and got thrown back out into deep space and is going to go visit somebody else, apparently. right? It's going to go do its own thing. Um, so that does happen on the solar system scale. And so there's a logical question, does that happen on the galaxy scale? And you get stars... In between galaxies. Yeah, that does happen. Um, what's really interesting, though, is that if we look at the universe at the scale of galaxies, there's this really interesting additional level of organization. I'm going to try and bring up a good picture of it. 
um, because this is one of those things that it just absolutely cooks my own noodle for sure. I, I this is something that blows my mind. So let me see here. I'm gonna do um, Virgo. Uh, I'm gonna do galactic filament. No. Um, observable universe. Let me see if I can get a cool image of what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is a bit of an artist's impression of how it works, but I'm going to show it to you. So this image right here. Every single dot in this image represents an entire galaxy, right? And this is an artist's impression. This is not a real image somebody took, but this is an artist's impression based on data of how the universe is organized. And so it turns out that the galaxies aren't just randomly scattered throughout the universe, but instead you you get these like filament structures almost where there's like these chains of galaxies and these clusters of galaxies that themselves are part of larger super clusters and they all form like these sort of big chain structures and things and then you get these areas between them where there's relatively low density and what blows my mind about that is this is i mean we're looking at billions of light years here in this image and there are places in the universe where galaxies are literally just running into each other there's so many right and i can actually show you a piece of the sky where you can check it out for yourself with a telescope there's literally galaxies like on top of each other and then you get like you go from one filament to the next and there is a space between them an unimaginably huge area of just nothing of just nothing at all until you hit the next filament that's just alive with galaxies and that to me is like mind blowing. Like I, I, you know, I have my sister used to always say like, oh, it's space is so huge. Sometimes it freaks me out. That's the one that does it to me is imagining this conception of like, if we could somehow leave our galaxy, leave our cluster, leave our super cluster, leave our big filament structure and go to the next filament, how much of just absolute nothing we would travel through before we got there is like gut wrenching to think of that much, nothing that much, just void that's out there from one film into the next, I think is actually a really cool topic, but yeah, that's, that's, that's how the universe seems to be organized. And this kind of gets into the dark matter thing. Um, but I'm going to hop in the, qu the questions real fast before I start launching into talking about dark matter. Um, somebody says, Oh, do you know where we are in this picture? I don't think this particular picture actually represents anything specific. Like, there, I don't know if there's any particular dot in this image that's meant to be our Milky Way. This is just meant to be a representation of the kind of structure we see in the universe. Um, and this would be, like, on, the, on that kind of scale. Um, but I don't think it's, like, I don't think these filaments in this artist's impression correlate to real filaments in real life necessarily on like a one-to-one -one basis so i'm not sure where we are in this image um or if or if we are in this image but that's a good question and then somebody said are there places where it is so far from anything that you wouldn't be able to see any stars um so that's a really good question presently the answer seems to be no um and the real question is that when we're talking about being able to see stars we're really uh, asking a question about time because what keeps us from being able to see, say, the next galaxy over there is just the amount of time it's going to take for that light to get to us, right? So light travels at 186,300 miles a second or 300,000 kilometers a second. And it takes a certain amount of time to get to us, right? That's why we measure light year. A light year is just the distance that light goes in one year, right? That's a light year. And so if you say the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away. So that means that the light from the Andromeda galaxy took two and a half million years to get to us. In order to get so far away 
that you wouldn't see any stars in the sky, then you would have to get further away from any stars in light years than the age of the universe in actual years. So the universe is 13 and a half billion years old. So the answer to your question, basically we could take your question, we could reword it and say, is it possible to find a place in the universe where you are more than 13 and a half billion light years from any stars? I don't know if that's, I don't know if the answer to that. I guess it would depend on the distance between these two filaments because that's really the determining factor, right? Are there any of these galactic filaments, these sort of gaps between them, are there any of them that are more than 13 and a half billion light years apart? And I don't know if there are. What is interesting, though, is that the space between everything is expanding. So when we talk about the universe expanding, it's easy to imagine like a black hole or a galaxy is like running away from another galaxy, but actually space itself between the expa the galaxies is itself getting bigger. There's more space actually expanding between the two objects, driving them apart as much as they are just moving apart as the universe expands. And so as the universe keeps expanding, we now know from looking at old light from distant objects and then the stuff closer to us and looking at the trends that the universe is actually ex expanding at an accelerating rate. And although mass, matter, objects can't move faster than the speed of light, the fabric of the universe doesn't have that limitation. So it could get to the point one day where space itself is expanding faster than light moves. So that the light from a star is coming towards us, but the space between us and that star is expanding quicker than the light can get through it to get to us. And so you would eventually get a point where the universe is expanding so rapidly that light can't get to anything from anything else. It's expanding faster than the light can move between the stars. And so the sky would go dark because you wouldn't be able to see any distant starlight because the space between you and those things is expanding too quickly. Galaxies, of course, flying apart by this point because the stars aren't staying together and all that. Um, so there is a, a hypothetical future in which it would get to be, to the point where we wouldn't be able to tell that there's anything else in the universe. And it's fortunate that we live now when we still can. Uh, it's going to be amazing to see pictures in deep space from James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, I am uh, really excited about the James Webb Space Telescope. I can't wait to see uh, some of that stuff. We've been waiting for a while on the James Webb. Um, but... You know, the Hubble has been out there working real hard for a long time, and I'm I'm ready to have a new cool telescope, right? Um, I told you I would show you a, a place where you could find um, galaxies practically on top of each other. So let me get back to the Stellarium real fast. I'm loving these questions, by the way. Excellent questions in the chat discussion. Um, this is the kind of thing I like to see. Don't be Don't be shy about asking whatever questions occur to you. Um, in fact, I'm actually going to say real fast, when we do our in-person stuff and I do my laser pointer thing and I, I do these talks, um, I'm always excited when we have children at our events because children don't have whatever that thing is in the adult brain that says, don't ask that question, you're going to look foolish and makes us too scared to learn. Children don't have that. And children ask questions I would never think to ask. And those are sometimes the coolest questions that have the coolest answers. So I know we have a couple of young people in our chat tonight. And maybe that's part of the reason why we're getting some really cool questions. Um, but definitely keep that going. And for the adults in the audience, be like a child. If you have some question that you feel weird asking or you feel dumb, you don't want to look dumb, now's the time to look dumb. Ask those questions because those are always, I guarantee you, the dumb questions always the best questions they they really do lead to some really cool discussion you saw how cool the question about are there stars outside a galaxy you saw how cool that got right any question not that this dumb question don't misunderstand me but i'm just saying you see how these off the wall kinds of questions are the are the really interesting things so right i was talking about galaxies so if we move over and we look do, 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 do over in this direction and actually now's the right now's not the right time of year i'm going to time travel 
in my software. Do do do. We're gonna go back to June, right? So June is what I like to call galaxy season. Um, so during the right time of the year, when we see the constellations Leo and Virgo, there's this star right here called Vendemiatrix, and then there's this star right here called Denebola. Between these two is a piece of sky we call the Virgo Cluster. Uh, those of us in the Astronomy Club like to call it the Virgo Clutter because it is just cluttered with stars, and, or with galaxies, I should say, excuse me. So all these stars you're seeing, by the way, those are in our own galaxy, but we could look past them because we can see through the empty space between them, right? So if we if I zoom in here, Stellarium uses like a little oval shape to represent a galaxy. Not this one. This is highlighting an object. But if I zoom in, you see galaxy, galaxy, boom, 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 boom. Here's some galaxies. All these little things with the little blue circles around them. These are all galaxies. So if we're going from Venn to Myatrix, and if I zoom in, it just keeps adding them in the software, right? Like the software, the more I zoom in, the more it just reveals more of them. So you got a couple there, galaxy. Here's a bunch of galaxies. Here's a, this piece of sky right here is absolutely stupid with galaxies. Um, here's more of those little tiny guys. And you see there's some that aren't even marked. You see how next to M86 there's like this little line? Okay, if I zoom in, oh, look, there's even more, right? There's just so many galaxies in this patch of the universe, man, just all over the place. What is going on? Why do we have... Oh, yeah, the big circle is telling me where Markarian's chain is. Markarian's chain is what we call this chain of galaxies. Um, even in an amateur scope, you can see these. Uh, in fact, I can show you again. If you guys really like my sketches, I'll show you my sketch of Markarian's chain, um, in which I sketched it and later counted. There was, a, uh, I think it was like 11 galaxies all in one view together right so what's happening here what's going on is that this is it just happens to be that when we look that way we're looking towards the most dense region of what we call the virgo supercluster so just like how i talked about where we live within our galaxy our galaxy is part of a cluster of galaxies but we live out near the outskirts of that cluster we actually live in a surprisingly low density region in terms of galactic density in terms of how many galaxies there are kind of all on top of each other we gotta live sort of in the boonies when it comes to galaxies and if we look this way we're looking in towards the core of the supercluster where it's much much more crowded if our galaxy were there you would look up at night and naked eye you would see a bunch of other galaxies um, because of how much they're just all clumped on top of each other there so that is when you get a chance in, in and around like the june time uh, that's a, a really cool thing to look at is the Virgo cluster and just look all throughout there. And there's not just Virgo, by the way. If we, if we, if we move over into Leo and I zoom in, there are actually several galaxies here too. Boom, boom, boom. There's three right there. Uh, if I go back here, there's another three right there. If I zoom in a bit, there's several of them here in the tail. We got, well, there's one, there's several of them, right? There's a lot of galaxies in through Leo as well in this piece of sky. So the uh, sort of May, June, July time of year, that's galaxy season, man. That is a good time to look at galaxies. Uh, what we are moving into now here in September, if I come back. September, what do we got here? Um, I'd say we're getting into like the fall and winter. We're looking more at nearby things within the galaxy um, star clusters are a big thing so uh, if we come to tonight august this piece of sky over here near the galactic core is actually really good for a class of object called globular clusters uh, i've talked about these before in previous videos um, but globular clusters are basically they're almost like many galaxies they're really dense balls of stars that you'll find within galaxies um, to bring up a couple of examples here in my visual aid search. Uh, let's do M13. M13 is always a good one. Right, so uh, Messier 13 right here. That's a, a globular cluster. So all those little specks, those are all stars. 
Um, this one's in the constellation Hercules. Um, and actually, in the software, the, the symbol here in Stellarium for a globular cluster is this circle with a cross in it. So this one right here, NGC 6553, let's find out what that looks like. NGC 6553. And if you guys can't tell, by the way, I'm just kind of making up stuff to talk about because I've kind of run out of topics. So definitely don't be scared to uh, throw some questions in the chat there. All right, so that image is loading. Let me bring it up here. Oof, this is a high-res image, man. It is taking a second to load. Let me let that load here for us, but I don't feel like waiting on it. Anyway, it was a ball of stars, another globular cluster, 6553. My point being, though, that this piece of sky is really good for that, uh, for looking at globular clusters. Um, now, here's another question I'm going to pose to you guys. Uh, in the chat, and then we're going to circle back around to it, kind of like I did with the moon. Can anyone tell me how globular clusters form? How a globular cluster actually forms? Uh, looks like Emily's heading out. Cool, yeah, I'm going to do this. Uh, quick announcement to everybody. Uh, this is going to be the third Thursday of the month, I've decided. I was kind of doing this thing where I was basing it on, like, you know, trying to follow the lunar phases, and then I realized that's dumb because I'm not going to build my audience if nobody does want to tune in. So third Thursday of the month is what I'm going to do. It. So every every month, third Thursday, we're doing this unless it's a holiday. Emily, have a great night. I'm so glad that you and the kids are here. Uh, you guys were awesome participating in the chat, and, and, and love to see you guys come back again. All right, so uh, let's see here. So, uh, somebody's messaging me on Facebook. I'm just going to say thanks real fast. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, gosh, what do you guys want to talk about, man? We talked about globular clusters. We talked about galaxies. We can talk about all kinds of cool stuff, man. Um, let me just take a breath and look at the... Look at the, the live chat here. I mentioned getting different constellations during uh, different times of the year. I will quickly say that um, that is related to what I was talking about before. How as we orbit the, the sun, our window on the universe shifts. And so that's why we get different constellations at different times of the year. Uh, I guess until we get a, a question, I'm just going to do some more constellation stuff. Um, cause I do, I love talking about like what's in the sky, right. And talking about constellations. So I'm going to delete the lines real fast and add the atmosphere again. So these are like the worst possible observing conditions. And we're going to talk about what you can still manage to see, even if you live in a light polluted area, uh, like Jacksonville or a more suburban area like Orange Park or Middleburg or some other place. If you're tuning in from one of the other Facebook pages, that's not in Jacksonville. So we talked about. Scorpius and Sagittarius here in the southern sky. Um, those are big and bright and easy to spot. One thing I'll point out, and this is just very useful to know all year round, is how to find the dippers. Right? Everyone wants to be able to find the dippers. So the Big Dipper is the easiest one. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look to the north. right? So you'll notice in our software, I mentioned before how the size of the dot correlates to the brightness of the star. Right, so the Big Dipper, you'll notice, is all very bright stars, right? Alcade, Mizar, Alioth, Megrez, Fecta, I, who named these things? Mirac, Dube, right? These are the Big Dipper stars. And so you'll see the Big Dipper is super bright, right? So the Big Dipper is a really cool constellation to get used to finding because you can use it to find other constellations, and that's what we're going to talk about now. I think I wore this shirt last time I got a haircut because it is, like, irritating my neck. Anyway, um, so the Big Dipper, the trick to finding the Big Dipper is just look north. All right, look north, and you'll usually find it. It's bright. This sort of curved tail is usually really easy to spot, and expect it to be big, right? The first time I ever found the Big Dipper, um, I realized 
that it was bigger than I thought it would be. I'm picturing like, okay, uh, nah, nah, whatever. No, it's huge. It's enormous. It takes up a giant chunk of sky. So expect it to be big. Um, once you find the Big Dipper, um, you've actually found a constellation called Ursa Major. I'm going to time travel just a little bit so that I can show you the whole constellation. If I add the lines, you'll see the Big Dipper is actually just part of it. Right? Ursa Major actually includes some of these other stars. And if I put in the artwork, it's supposed to represent a big bear. right? So Ursa Major is the big bear. Uh, the Big Dipper is something we call an asterism. And I've, again, I've mentioned this in all previous episodes of the show, but I am always always reiterate because you don't know who's in the audience. So an asterism is what we call any pattern, easily recognizable pattern of stars in the sky that is not itself actually considered a constellation, right? So the constellations, there's 88 of them. They're officially recognized by the International Astronomical Union as the official constellations. And technically a constellation is actually not just the stars, but if I can get, I don't think the free version, or I don't think the web-based version shows this, but they have borders basically. So this empty piece of sky here is considered part of Ursa Major, right? So the constellations are a way of cutting up the sky into pieces. The asterisms are easy to recognize patterns that are not themselves constellations. So the Big Dipper is an asterism that is part of a constellation called Ursa Major. Now, once you've found the Big Dipper slash Ursa Major, we can use that. I'm going to check the chat real fast. Okay, still no questions. We can use that to find some other constellations. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to practice that now. So, we're going to take the edge of the bowl of the Big Dipper, Mirac and Dubé, these two stars right here. And we're going to draw a line through them going upwards from the bowl, right? So imagine the bowl is open on this end. We're going to go upwards from the bowl through these two stars. And we're just going to keep going until we hit a bright star, which is this guy right here. Now, in the software represented on a flat screen, it does look like we have to curve our line slightly to get it. It's it's not perfectly straight, but it's basically where it should be. And on a real sky, it's like that, right? So, but more or less, you can just kind of shoot through those, and you'll get in the ballpark, and you'll see it. This bright star over here. That's Polaris. Now, Polaris is the North Star, and there's a very common misconception that Polaris is the brightest. It's not. Um, Polaris is the 43rd brightest star. It actually barely makes the top 50. Um but the real thing about Polaris is that it's always north, right? And in fact, if I add in the lines to make this a little bit easier to see and maybe put in the artwork, and if I start time traveling, you'll see that everything seems to rotate around Polaris, right? But Polaris itself barely moves. You'll see it does trace small circles, but for the most part, it barely moves. So if we come back to now or actually tonight, this software always takes you to when it's going to be dark. If we come back to now, find Polaris. Once we've found Polaris, as you can see, we've also found the Little Dipper, or Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Right? So that's one more constellation, and the North Star. You'll, you'll notice there's a set of constellations here all around Ursa Minor. We call those constellations circumpolar, meaning around the pole. And the cool thing about the circumpolar constellations is they're not really seasonal like the other constellations are. They all just sort of rotate around the North Star, but they stick around most of the year, which means that circumpolar constellations are pretty much always available to you, right? Um, another good circumpolar constellation, which you can find by basically find the North Star, right? And then imagine you're trying to balance the scales between the Big Dipper over on the left side Pretty much exactly opposite, you should find another constellation of very bright stars that looks like a big M. And that's Cassiopeia. It looks like a W or an M, depending on where it is in the sky. Right? If I delete all the artwork and stuff and delete the atmosphere, well, let's put the atmosphere back. You can see how bright these stars are. I've spotted Cassiopeia from downtown Jacksonville. Same thing with the Big Dipper. These are all really bright constellations, right? We could get into some dimmer ones, but I want to show you ones that you'll find absolutely anywhere right? Uh, somebody wants to know about the three leaps of the gazelle. Yeah, cool. I'll show that one in a second. So 
the 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 trick I find to to getting good at finding constellations is to learn to find big, bright, easy ones, and then you can start using those to help you find fainter ones. Right? You'll you'll do that. So so the skill that I want to teach you, the things I want to show you now, are going to be the big, bright ones that are going to help you then learn more. So uh, real fast before we move on, somebody asked about it, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, there's an asterism that we call the three leaps of the gazelle, and it's found near Ursa Major. So if I time travel a little, whoop, whoop, hold up. Oh my goodness, I completely lost my constellations here. Let me get it back. Okay, here we go. So if you find the Big Dipper, there are three pairs of stars. One, two. One, two. One, two. And we call those the three leaps of the gazelle. So if you imagine like a grassy field right here and a gazelle is running from a lion, it jumps, jumps again, jumps again. Uh, Dennis, one of our club members named Dennis, pointed that out to me. I, I had never heard of the three leaps of the, of the gazelle. And now I like showing it to other people. So you see the gazelle with boing, boing, boing. He jumps three times, right? Uh, so that's a cool asterism to look out for. So when we come over here, I'm going to time travel this back to roughly now again. So we find the Cassiopeia, right? So again, we find the Big Dipper. We trace the edge of the Big Dipper to find Polaris. And then we go basically directly opposite and find the big glowing M in the sky. And that is Cassiopeia. Now, Cassiopeia is a really cool constellation to know how to find because it helps you find the Andromeda galaxy, right? So if you find, you see how there's a tall part of the M and then there's like a stretched out part of the M? The tall part of the M, it actually points, if we shoot through it like an arrow through a ball, points at this reddish star here called Mirac. And then we can jump one star, two stars over here. If I zoom in a little bit, you see boom, boom, boom. And then near that, Andromeda Galaxy, right? So Cassiopeia is a really cool one to know how to find because it helps us find the Andromeda Galaxy. It also helps us find something called the Double Cluster, but I'm going to put a pin in that for a second because I want to show you some more circumpolar constellations, right? We found the Big Dipper. We found the Little Dipper over here. We found Cassiopeia, right? We can throw, throw the lines back in there. Draco, I'll be honest, is hard. It's a hard one to find. Camelopardalis is a hard one to say, and it's a hard one to find. It's supposed to represent a, a, a camel leopard, which is an old-timey word for a giraffe. Um, but some other cool constellations we can find once we find the Big Dipper. We can trace along the curve of the tail of the Big Dipper, the handle, and we can follow this arc over to this bright star called Arcturus. And so the saying is, we arc to Arcturus, right? Again, feel free to hop in with questions in the chat about anything you guys are interested in while I'm talking about this. Uh, once we find Arcturus, we have found this big uh, sort of tie shape. I feel like it's a necktie. It looks like a necktie to me, right? You got the thing here and then the necktie coming down. Um, or it, if you want to imagine, it's like one of those, uh, like an ictus fish, like people put on their car, right? Like... You can sort of picture the big fish, and it kind of crosses there. Um, what this is, this is Baudis, the herdsman. It's supposed to represent a shepherd. Uh, once you've arced to Arcturus, we're going to time travel a little bit just to make this a little easier to find here. Oh, boy, I threw everything off. Where did everything go? I time traveled the wrong direction. Here we go. All right. Once you arc to Arcturus, you can keep going and spike onto Spica. Right, arc to Arcturus, and then spike to Spica, and we have now found the constellation Virgo. Right, Virgo is a little bit faint; it's not as easy to find. Spica is obvious, and so is Porima. Um, but then we have these sort of faint guys here and here, and then it all kind of dwindles off into kind of obscurity. But that's how you find Virgo. So now we've found another constellation, but there's still more we can do, right? The Big Dipper has more to show us because if I time travel some more, right? Here I have my Big Dipper. I'm going to imagine that I scooped a bunch of water in the Big Dipper, but there's a hole in my Dipper, right? There's a hole in the bottom. 
that water is going to drain out. And as it does, that water is going to drain out and it's going to land on the back of Leo the lion. Right? I said, so we look straight below the Big Dipper and this is where we should start looking for Leo. The trick to finding Leo is to find this backwards question mark of stars. Right? We often call, that's another asterism, we like to call that the sickle. Right? And that is Leo. This is the constellation Leo. And this is where I'm going to disagree with every artist who's ever drawn art for Leo. For some reason, people like to show him running. I disagree, because where are the legs, right? I don't see any legs. I've always imagined that Leo's lying down, like the MGM lion, right? And this big curve of stars here is his mane. And I've actually seen artists put his face up here and try to like draw a line here and make this a head. You're out of your mind. Clearly, this is the lion's mane. This is the perfect lion's mane. I disagree with some people who draw these pictures for the charts. And I feel like I should publish my own because uh, whoever did this artwork, I agree with this guy. That's a lion's mane, right? You'll notice there's actually a Leo Minor. Uh, the lion actually does have a cub, if you've ever been curious about that. Uh, and then, of course, now that we found Leo and we found Virgo... We could find the Virgo cluster, right? Um, another constellation we could find while we're in this piece of sky is this sort of triangular shape here called Coma Berenices, but you see how tiny these dots are? These are all really faint, but you see how there's a lot of little stars here? If you get out somewhere dark, and I'll actually zoom in and show you that there are a bunch of more stars and galaxies and stuff in Coma Berenices, it may not look like much in the software, but out somewhere dark, you'll often notice... Like, you'll be looking at Leo, you'll be looking at Virgo, and then you're like, what is that, like, glittery cluster over there? What's going on there? And that's come Berenice. That's Bernice's hair. All right, coming back to the Big Dipper again. Let me think. Is there anything else we could find from the Big Dipper? Where did it go? Here it goes. I guess that's mainly it. Arc to Arcturus, Spike to Spica. Those are the big use the Dipper to find them constellations. Um, once we find Cassiopeia... Where did it go? Okay, here's my dipper. Here's Polaris. There it is. It's down here on this building. Okay. We're going to go back to present. So once we find Cassiopeia, we can find the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, and actually, we still don't have any questions in the chat. So I'm just going to feed my own ego and talk about one of my favorite things, if you guys will indulge me. So I'm going to time travel even further into the winter real fast, just so we have a really good look at it. All right. So we've moved into the winter a little bit. I'm going to bring up the constellations. So in the winter time, there's this big square asterism that we call the Great Square of Pegasus. It's another easy one to find, right? When you're in this piece of sky... Um, you are basically looking at the entire myth of Perseus played out in the sky. So if you know your Greek mythology, Perseus, and you can find Perseus if you find Cassiopeia, and you go the little squished part of the M, you look to the right of that, you got this sort of like Y split shape kind of thing going on there. That's the constellation Perseus. So Perseus is uh, one of Zeus's many illegitimate uh, <laughs> half-human children, and he was prophesied to kill his grandfather. So his grandfather locked his mother in a tower and then like locked her and her son in a box and threw him in the ocean. And none of it worked. Perseus still ended up growing up. They were raised by like a fisherman or whatever. And then he went on a quest. Uh, so Perseus went off and he slew Medusa. And traditionally in the constellation, these stars over here by Algol are depicted as Medusa's head, right? There it is. So Perseus runs off and he slays the he slays Medusa. He looks at her reflection in his shield so he doesn't get turned to stone, talk, takes that head right off. Now, as Perseus is coming home, he encounters a beautiful woman chained to a rock by the coast. Now, that woman's name is Andromeda, and she's actually represented by this con constellation right here, which just looks like more or less a chain of stars. Add the artwork. Whoop, hold on. 
add the artwork, there she is. And you see she's chained up, right? The artist has depicted her chained up. Well, it turns out that Andromeda is chained up because her mother, Cassiopeia, which is the big M, had bragged about how beautiful she was, all right? And you should never brag about how beautiful you are when the gods are listening. So she had to, uh, basically, Poseidon was going to send a sea monster to destroy, uh, actually, I think what it was is they had stopped sacrificing to Poseidon or something. I forget the deal. But he was going to destroy their city if they didn't offer Andromeda as a sacrifice to that sea monster, right? So the sea monster was going to take Andromeda and spare the city. In the old, like, Claymation Clash of the Titans, and probably the new one that I didn't bother seeing, they call that creature the Kraken. The Kraken's actually from Norse myth. Um, but it is just a sea monster, right? Uh, it actually has a name. I forget its name. But anyway, that sea monster is also depicted. But real fast, Cassiopeia, her husband's up here too. That's Cepheus, right? They were the king and queen of Ethiopia. And then their daughter, Andromeda. So where is the sea monster? Well, the sea monster is over here. The constellation Cetus. Now, you'll often hear this called Cetus the Whale, but because Cetus means whale in Latin, but traditionally this constellation is also associated with the sea monster from the story of Perseus. So Perseus used Medusa's head, turned the sea monster to stone, and rescued Andromeda. Now, there's one more constellation up here from the story of Perseus. Because, you see, when Perseus decapitated Medusa... The stump of Medusa's neck, and there's two different versions of it. Some versions say they just sprang from the neck. Some say the blood from her neck gave rise to the creatures. But either way, Medusa's two children from her neck stump are a figure named Creseor that comes up almost never in the mythology and not much is known about him, and Pegasus, the great winged horse, who also happens to be up here in the sky, represented by this big box. And then when his head is over here, his forelimbs are here and here, and his wings are presumably in here someplace. And that is, if I add the artwork, that's Pegasus. So this piece of sky has all the character, all the major characters of Perseus' story, except his grandfather, that he was like prophesied to kill one day. And the prophecy does come true at the end of the story, after he's done with all his, you know, heroing and all his cool stuff. Um, he actually, they reconcile with his grandfather and um, his grandfather comes to encourage him at the Olympics because he goes to compete in the Olympics and they're there to like cheer for him and root for him. And Perseus is throwing a discus, the big heavy disc, and the wind catches it and the discus flies off and hits his grandfather in the head and kills him and actually fulfills the prophecy. So there you go. Can't escape your fate, right? That's the, that's the lesson of all Greek mythology. You can't escape your fate. We have about a half hour left of the presentation. Uh, looks like the chat has calmed down a lot. Uh, I know we still have some people here, though. I see that we've got five concurrent viewers. So you guys must not be bored. You guys must be enjoying this talk about monster slaying and stuff. But I'm going to pause for a second and give you guys a chance to talk. Again, while I'm going on about whatever, feel free to interject with a question or even if you don't have a question necessarily, if there's just a topic that you're interested in and you want to talk more about comets or planets or what have you, throw that in the chat. Just bring bring that up in the chat, man, because I love I love those questions. Those give me a jumping off point that I can use to talk about all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, but I'm gonna just real fast in this little bit of a lull here. We'll I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. So I want to remind everybody that. Okay, cool. You guys are totally not bored. Awesome. If you're loving it, I'm loving it. Believe me, having people sit and listen to me go on about myths, it must be my birthday. Honestly, like that is that is uh, that is a dream come true for me. So I'm glad you guys are enjoying this stuff. So, um, like I said, a little bit of house cleaning though, uh, or housekeeping. I want to remind everybody that um, I do this every month, third Thursday of the month. Um, also want to remind you guys that I am part of an astronomy club called Nephis. If you live in the greater Jacksonville area, definitely check us out. If you don't live in the Jacksonville area, welcome. I'm glad to have you here tonight. Um, if you are one of the five people watching and you haven't asked a question or said anything in a while, just say hi in the chat. Just let me know you're here. I'm just curious who's here. Um, and I can only share this so far, right? I really want to grow this show. Right. And my goal for this 
is to be a virtual version of what we do in person every month at Hannah Park. And I guess I'll mention that too while I'm on the topic. Every month uh, on the Saturday closest to first quarter moon, we set up telescopes at a place here in Jacksonville called Hannah Park. And we let members of the general public, people just come, they can look through telescopes. I give a laser pointer tour of the sky that's kind of like a much smaller version of what I just did. Um, and we talk about space and hang out and answer people's questions. I want this to become that, but online. Okay, cool. Uh, welcome aboard, Tom. And uh, yeah, I am starving, by the way. I, I am uh, definitely going to go grab something to eat after this show. I'll, I'll tell you that for sure. But yeah, we do the Hannah Park thing every month. Uh, myths surrounding Orion. I will happily talk about the myths around Orion. Um, so yeah, so this is something I'm, I'm planning on doing every month, third Thursday. Um, I post it on Facebook. I invite every one of my friends list. I post it to every astronomy group I'm a part of. And I feel like the same five or so people I actually got a bunch of new people tonight, which is cool. Uh, but I do get a lot of the same people every time. If you like this content and you think this is valuable, you think other people would enjoy this, please, please tell people, tell your friends. Uh, okay, it's Richard. I, I thought so. I didn't think it was Tom. Uh, please tell people, share this on your own Facebook page. Uh, actually send people invites, like invite people to the event, whatever. Let people know. And I want to grow this beyond, because a lot of people watching this, I know a lot of you guys, and I know you're already astronomy people. I want to get a lot of people who are new to astronomy, they don't know a lot about it, and they've always had questions about planets or comets or what have you, because the idea is I want this to be an educational thing. I want this to be a way that I can educate as many people as possible. So please help me grow this thing by sharing it with other people. Obviously, like, subscribe, comment, all the YouTube things as well. But but definitely um, promote this uh, if you believe in it. I really would appreciate that. Um, so that's a bit of housekeeping I wanted to do real fast. A little call to action, right? Please. Please. Um, Share this when I when I post it. Spread it, man. Spread this thing. I want it to go far and wide. I want to blow it up. I want to hop on and see that I've got 300 people and the chat is just scrolling because people are talking, man. That's my goal. Uh, Sputnik Hubble says, I'm a new Nephis member and this is my first time on this channel. Having a great time. Loving it, dude. Uh, so if you're a brand new Nephis member, I'm our membership director. Uh, so you definitely got an email from me saying, welcome. Unless you join like this week and I've been lazy and I haven't emailed you yet, I'm going to take care of that after the presentation tonight. I've been letting it slip a little, um, but welcome to the club and I uh, can't wait to can't wait to see you in person, whoever you are. Uh, you don't have to identify yourself in the chat because I know you're on the internet right now, but uh, definitely glad you could make it. So somebody asked about the myths surrounding Orion. So Orion is a winter constellation. We're going to get that later in the year. Um, I mentioned how Scorpius is in the sky tonight, which means that Orion will not be, right? And that bring and that is the sort of lead into the story I have about Orion. So Orion um, is another one of those great guidepost constellations for the winter sky. As we move into the winter, Orion's really easy to find. I'm gonna uh, can I remove the? I guess not. Uh, so if you notice, these are all particularly bright stars here. You got the belt, the classic belt, Al-Nilam, Al-Nitak, Al and Mintaka. I said those backwards. Al-Nitak, Al-Nilam, and Mintaka. Um, episode of Star Trek, by the way, in The Next Generation, Who Watches the Watchers, uh, takes place on a planet orbiting Mintaka. It's probably one of the best episodes of Star Trek ever. Watch it. It's phenomenal. But anyway, <laughs> this is where it takes place. It's a, Mintaka's a real star. Um and then we've got the Orion shoulders, Beetlejuice and Bellatrix, and his knees. I've again, I'm going to disagree with the artists on this. I've always interpreted the knee, these as like this is like the hem of like his robes, right? I've always pictured the big hourglass as like he's wearing like old school like Greek style, and I've always just sort of mentally imagined legs down here. A lot of artists will actually put his feet up here on these stars. I I guess you can. That's a matter of opinion. But to me, this is a torso. I, I've never pictured that he's got to gotta bring his knee up just so Rigel can be his foot. I mean, to be honest, though, Rigel does mean foot, so maybe I'm the, the guy who's wrong. Uh, and then we got these stars up here that form his head. Now, getting into the myth of Orion, I'm going to go ahead and bring in the art real fast, because this art is wrong. 
And this is another place where I disagree with the people who do the art. There's a, a bit of a tradition when it comes to artistic representation of the constellations, how we draw the pictures to represent them. They go all the way back to like medieval manuscripts and stuff. And Orion is traditionally shown in a lot of old sources is shown with a club and a lion skin. But that's because Orion has somehow been conflated with Hercules. Because Hercules wielded a club and killed the Nemean lion and wore its skin. And there is already a Hercules constellation, which we will find... Actually, I don't think Hercules is a winter thing. I think we'd have to come to the summer. But anyway, there is a Hercules constellation already, right? So we don't need Orion to be Hercules. And if I remove the artwork and add in the lines, it seems to me personally that he's wielding a bow, right? Obviously. And, and, and the thing about Orion is he's a hunter, right? He's Orion the hunter. So I've always pictured that he's wielding a bow and he's reaching back for more arrows, right? Which is why he's got his arm up here. So I wish more people would depict him with a bow and arrows than with a lion skin. Because I feel like this sort of blurs Orion into Hercules. And I think that's unnecessary because Orion kind of has his own stuff. So I've been putting it off long enough. What is the actual myth about Orion? So Orion actually has several myths about him and he's not as concrete of a figure in mythology as Hercules. Right? Hercules has his 10 labors. Perseus has his Medusa slaying. Theses has the Minotaur. Orion has a few different myths about him. Um, there's one source in the old mythology that says Orion is the only mortal that Artemis ever loved. But there don't really seem to be any other stories that agree with that. And there's a lot of other stories where Artemis wants him killed for various reasons, right? One of the myths about Orion is that he tried to... Uh, I try to keep this show family friendly. He tried to hug... The Pleiades, <laughs> we'll say that. Um, the Pleiades are the daughters of Atlas, the giant Atlas, right? He has six daughters called the, seven daughters called the Pleiades of the Seven Sisters, and they are represented by the Pleiades, this star cluster right here. So because of the myth is that Orion tried to get with the Pleiades, we see Orion and the Pleiades, and if I time travel hour by hour, we will see that Orion chases them across the sky, right? Now... It's hard to say whether that myth existed and these things got named after the myth or whether the constellations were named first and then people made up a, a sort of just-so story about why that is. Oh, Orion chases the Pleiades to the sky. That must be because Orion in life chased the Pleiades sisters in life, right? They made up the story to go with the constellations. And a lot of the myth of Orion does seem to follow an astronomical sort of thing because there's one story where Orion pursues the Pleiades sisters, they escape to the west, right? And he goes off to the west. I think he starts off in Helios's house to the east because there's like a version where he's Helios' son. And Hel Helios is like, yeah, man, go for it. And then Orion like goes after them. He goes to the west. And then they be they're turned into stars so they can get away from him. And then Zeus turns him, him into stars because sometimes Zeus is a jerk. Right, And so that sort of mirrors Orion's path across the sky. But other versions of the myth have it that Artemis disliked him for various reasons and wanted him killed. Uh, and one version of Orion's story is that he was actually killed by a scorpion. And then the gods put him in the sky as a constellation. And so this story is the reason. And again, the constellations probably predate the story. And this was a story made up to explain the constellations. But... This is the reason why I said, when I first started talking about Orion, where I said that we have Scorpius tonight, which means we won't see Orion. Because you will never see Orion and Scorpius in the sky at the same time. And the story is, is because they were enemies in life, and so they never share the sky in death, right? So they're always on opposite sides of the sky. So, uh, <laughs> Richard says, oh no, the bow versus the, the, the lion again. Listen, I, this is my soapbox. Okay, I'm dying on this hill. I am never going to get tired of talking about the bow versus the lion. I will fight anybody. <laughs> right? It's a bow. 
But anyway, so yeah, so that's some of the mythology around Orion. I'll be honest, I wish I knew more of the stories about Orion. I should look them up. But um, there is sort of this this thing. Um, some of the stories actually talk about Orion being a giant and that he just walked through the ocean pursuing the Pleiades, right? He just like walked up to here in the ocean just going because he was enormous, right? He was, he was actually a giant, which again, probably a giant because he's big in the sky, right? But yeah, you'll never see Orion and, and Scorpius in the sky at the same time uh, because the story is that Scorpius killed Orion. Another version of the myth that I heard is that Orion hunted to extinction a species of giant scorpion. and that That's why they're in opposite parts of the sky. So there's different versions of it. Uh, one of the things that's really easy to, to think about mythology is, is you sometimes you think of it the way we think of... Um, stories now right where we like write books and we make movies and things get solidified in canon but back in the day there often wasn't canon and these were like folk tales that people would tell and you know people tell it differently in athens than they would tell it in sparta right and you'd get these different versions and oftentimes there wasn't like one canonical version of the story um and so for a lot of myths uh you if you Google them, you'll find wildly different versions of the, of the myth. And so it's not necessarily like I'm telling the story wrong. It's like, I'm telling the version of Orion that I learned. And then there's other versions and you can learn different versions of a lot of these myths. While we're on the subject of Orion though, I like to sometimes, and this is getting a little bit into a topic that we talked about. Uh, last time I did one of these presentations, which is um, a lot of our star lore comes from the Greek. Star lore is the term you have for like all the stories and things about the stars. Our star lore here in the West, we kind of inherited from Greek civilization, right? But every p group of people has seen different things in the sky, right? And I like to give shout outs to other cultures when I can. And I find it fascinating to learn about other star lore. So the ancient Norse people, the, the, the medieval Scandinavians, uh, they saw, instead of Orion, the hunter, they saw the goddess Frigg. And so this is Frigg, and the belt was said to be her distaff. The distaff is the, um, the big staff that you put the wool on when you're going to spin it into yarn, right? It's part of the, or part of the yarn making process. I, I don't know the yarn making process. There's like a spinning wheel is involved too. I don't know. But that's, you You make, uh, you, you just put it on a spindle and I think you run that through the wheel. I'm not sure. But anyway, that's called a, a distaff. And then you have a spindle like below it, right? And you do the thing. So the ancient Norse view was that this is Frigg. The belt is the distaff. And then the three stars below the belt that we say is Orion's sword, they said that's Frigg's spindle hanging below the distaff as she's spinning the wool into yarn. All right. Another cool thing um, from Norse mythology is these two stars, Castor and Pollux, those represent the twins of Gemini. They're the heads of the twins if we put in the constellation, right? Well, there's a Norse story about a giant named Thiazi who was slain by the gods and to appease his daughter, um, they had to promise her several things uh, to make up for slaying her father. And one of the things was they had to put his eyes in the heavens. And so those are said to be Theazi's eyes, right? So I think that's kind of an interesting tidbit there as well. Um, let's see. What else can we talk about? I'm going to come back to now and see the sky we have now. Uh, Andromeda Galaxy actually in the sky tonight. It's, uh, what direction is that? Sort of north east. So that should be rising. So that's good. You could try and check that out maybe. Um, I mentioned Jupiter and Saturn are good targets tonight. I want to reiterate, I mentioned this earlier, that there's going to be a transit of Io across Jupiter. Uh, Richard, you're in the chat now. What time is that thing? Can you tell us when that, uh, is going to be? And Mike says he's impatiently awaiting those winter skies. Yeah. 
I am too, man. Um, not only is it rough being an astronomer in Florida in the summertime, and I feel like we had a bad year this year. Like I feel like the clouds have been just nonstop these last couple months. Um, but also, uh, also the winter sky. I just like the winter sky. There's a lot of cool things to see. Uh, here we go. Sputnik's got a question. He asks, "Do you think we'll see Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice going supernova soon?" That's a good question. So talking about Orion, I'm just going to bring it back up again in the software. Um, so there's Scorpius, so that's the wrong time of year. Go to December. Badoop. Okay, so if we're looking at Orion, this one right here, Betelgeuse, is red. And Aldebaran is red as well. And, and I always point this out when I give my talks. Red stars are dying stars. These are red giants. They've swelled up and turned red because they're getting ready to die, right? So, Betelgeuse is a really big red giant star. So, any day now, it could go supernova. Or it could be a thousand years. Who knows, right? So the question is, do I think we're going to see Betelgeuse go supernova anytime soon? Honestly, supernovae are such brief events. And it's, you know, they're one of those things where oftentimes if you see a super, supernova, you're like super lucky. You got this... You got a chance to see a supernova but um yeah uh there's no reason it can't um or it could be a thousand years from now i really we really just don't know um when when it's going to happen to beetlejuice i will say that i would love it if it did right um actually i have mixed feelings i, I and i and i say this a lot because Orion is actually my favorite constellation, right? If, I, if I'm picking favorites, Orion's my favorite. I love the Orion constellation. Uh, I've mentioned in a video before I got my first tattoo ever recently. I'm kind of tempted to get a tattoo of Orion. I just absolutely love it. And if Betelgeuse popped, that would permanently change Orion, right? And so a part of me, I think, would kind of be sad that Orion would be different, that it would no longer have, he would no longer have a shoulder, it would no longer look like a person. And when we talk about Orion, we would always say, yeah, this is the constellation of Orion, which we now know is missing a star here, right? And it would permanently change things. So that would be, on the one hand, a little disappointing. But on the other hand, gosh, what a once in a lifetime thing to see, right? And Betelgeuse is close enough that it would light things up, man. It would be brighter than the full moon for a while and then it would go away right and then if you pointed a telescope there you would see a beautiful supernova remnant left in Betelgeuse's place so a part of me wants to see it pop and another part of me kind of hopes it never does because it, it, it's a part of my favorite constellations so I'm kind of torn about it but I feel like the part of me that wants to see it blow up is way bigger than the part of me that would be sad about it right I, I would I would be a little bit sad about it but it would be cool I think I'd be like, oh, man, it's kind of a bummer about Orion, but that was awesome. I think I would really like it. But, yeah, who knows? Now, I do know that a, a couple of years ago, I want to say, I keep saying a couple of years ago, COVID has ruined my sense of time. This might have been five years ago, for all I know. I, I really feel like I can't remember how long ago anything was. But we had, um, okay, cool. Richard says that the, the, the uh, transit of Io is just before 10 p.m. tonight. I'm going to try and catch it, honestly. That Transits are cool, man. Um, so yeah, point your telescope at Jupiter and look for a little dot. But um, there was a, a period not too long ago where Jupiter started dimming, or not Jupiter, uh, Betelgeuse. And it kept dimming and dimming and dimming and dimming. Now, Betelgeuse does fluctuate in brightness. It gets dimmer, it gets brighter. But it kept getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And I remember getting real excited because I was like, oh, let this be it, right? Let this be the day. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. And apparently I think they're saying that there was just like a cloud of dust that passed between us and Betelgeuse and made it look kind of dim for a bit. And then that cloud moved on with its life and Betelgeuse went back to being bright again. So, you, you know, we all got excited for nothing. We, we thought that maybe it was going to pop. And I remember the whole time there were like experts coming out. They're like, don't get too excited. We don't know that this means it's going to detonate. But I feel like secretly every one of those experts was like, yeah, but come on, do it, right? <laughs> come on and do it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, 
Uh, Richard says, if you zoom in on Jupiter, you can see it now. Yeah. So I just, uh, yeah, but I, I hope that it would be cool if it happens in our lifetime. I, I, I'm rooting for it. There's a few candidates, honestly. Jupiter's one of them. Um, Aldebaran's another. Any of these big red guys could pop, right? So, But Beetlejuice is one that they always say because it's pulsing and kind of fluctuating and everyone's like, oh, is it about to go? But it's been doing that for hundreds of years, so who knows, right? All right, well, thank you guys so much for attending. We've only got like six minutes left in this thing, so I'm going to use those to uh, do the last little bit of housekeeping and announcements. Um, again, I am a membership director for Nephis, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about Nephis. Uh, if you, again, if you live in the greater Jacksonville area and you're an astronomy person and you're not already a member, because I know lots of people in the chat right now are members, but if somehow you're not already, or you're watching this video later and you're not already a member, um, seriously consider joining. Uh, it's a really cool nonprofit organization that allows us to do lots of educational stuff like this, although this isn't costing me anything. But when we set up a Hannah Park, that costs us because we have to have insurance. Um, we also do a lot of things for our club members. Like, for example, right now we're doing an astrophotography contest. We're giving away some sweet prizes, right? So our membership dues allow us to do cool stuff like that. Uh, so you can just go to nephis.org, go to membership, join Nephis, right? Uh, if you're not in the Jacksonville area or you're not interested necessarily in joining the club, I still highly encourage you to get on our Facebook page and just be part of the conversation. Check out the cool uh, astrophotography stuff. Richard in our chat, you should see the images he gets of Jupiter. Cool stuff, man. Um, when I put up the end title card here, we're going to show a picture taken by one of our club members. We are a very active club with, um, I make my little doodles, but we've got some really talented astrophotographers and skilled observers all around. So if you want to get serious about astronomy, being a part of our club is a great way to get involved with a great group of guys. Um, membership rates, again, I'll point out. Um, students and seniors, 20 bucks. This is, this is for a whole year, by the way. You don't have to renew till the next year. Individuals, 40. Family, 50. That's just two adults and however many kids they happen to be in charge of. And then Benefactor and Corporate, uh, I always point out, you don't get anything extra necessarily. Sometimes, like if we're going to raffle, you get two tickets if you're a Benefactor. But really, these are just for people who want to be like a patron of the club uh, and give more, that's just an option to give more. But really, it's it's no different from just the individual membership. Um, we have a few people who do it because they, they want to support the club. Uh, but those are the rates. Uh, if you live in the St. Augustine area, again, uh, the Ancient City Astronomy Club is another wonderful group of guys you can get involved with. Um, and then the other thing I want to say, we do I'm doing this every uh, third Thursday of the month, so... Hopefully that makes it more predictable so more people can actually plan to attend these things that I'm doing. But let me also pull up, if you do happen to live in the Jacksonville area, I'm going to pull up our calendar real fast for the last few minutes and talk a little bit about upcoming events. Letting this calendar load. Oof, boy. The stream is hurting the bandwidth, I'm telling you. If this calendar ever loads, I will show you some of the things we have coming up. Um... If, by the way, if you're watching this video and you want us to come set up telescopes for your school or your, your homeschool group or your library or Boy Scout troop or whatever, then I'm going to show you in a second who to, who to email about that as well because we want to start filling our calendar up now that we're able to start doing things again. Again, we'll see, but that's the idea. I can't get this calendar to load, guys. I apologize. But basically... Um, we do the Hannah Park thing on the Saturday closest to uh, first quarter moon every month. Uh, and we set up a Hannah Park. It, we don't charge anything to attend. Uh, the park charges $5 to get in, and they close their gates at a certain time. So keep your eye on when they're going to close those gates so that you don't get uh, left out. Um, and then... Uh, keep an eye on that calendar for future upcoming events. Keep an eye on our Facebook page. I guess that's really all I have to say. Oh, right. I was going to talk about um, the, the board real fast. So if you are interested in reaching out to any of the board members of our club, if you want to pick my brain about anything we talked about tonight, or if you're interested in membership, or you just want to know how I get my beard to look like this, whatever, if you want to talk to me, 
I have an email address. You can email me right here. All right, that's me. I'm David Watley, the membership director. Um, if you, like I was saying before, if you're interested in having us come out and do something at your school or your homeschool group or your, your Boy Scout troop or whoever, uh, where is it? Did it do? Education director Greg Sauve, click, that's his email, right? You can email him and he'll arrange that with you as well. Uh, like I said, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. This video is not monetized and uh, this is just because we want to educate people, man. We want to talk about space. That's it for the show. Um, let's, I'm just going to take one last look at the comments. Hope it lasts. Yeah, this is the thing I fear, Jane, because I live in Florida, is I'm scared that Beetlejuice is going to go supernova in the middle of a hurricane, and we're not going to be able to see the once-in-a-lifetime Beetlejuice supernova. That's the thing that's that keeps me awake at night. All right. Thank you guys so much for attending. And have a wonderful evening.